Hello and welcome. My name is Rod Broad and along with Marjorie Thorogood I am one of two publicly elected governors representing Frimley Health Trust for Windsor and Maidenhead. I had hoped to be welcoming you in early July to the Royal Berkshire Hotel for one of our constituency meetings. Sadly we are not able to be there. We do know how much these meetings mean to our members as they give you a chance to meet your governors and trust managers and hear about what has been happening and keep you informed with developments at your NHS Trust. They also include a health talk which people find very interesting. As you are aware public events have been postponed for the time being and we are recording this video update for you. During the lockdown period your governors have continued to act as your representatives holding regular virtual meetings with trust executives and we would like to reassure you that all of your governors are active and are able to be contacted if you have anything you wish to raise. Hopefully the trust communications with you during this period have also helped to keep you informed. With the great challenges faced I am sure you will agree with me that the trust has responded exceptionally well and on your behalf I would like to thank all of the staff for their dedication and hard work. Way, way, way beyond the call of duty. It has been amazing. Also the community support has been brilliant. For example, food supply to scrub supply and much, much more. In addition, the public expression of support from everyone has been really appreciated. It has meant so much. Thank you. I'll hand over to our Chief Executive, Neil Dardis, who will give you a brief overview of what has been happening in the Trust lately. Hello, my name is Neil Dardis. I'm Chief Executive of Frimley Health NHS Foundation Trust. I wanted to take this opportunity to recognise and thank all of our teams and staff here at Frimley Health for their fantastic work in recent months dealing with the COVID challenges to date. It really has been humbling to see their dedication, commitment and passion to keep our patients safe and to respond in the most magnificent way to the biggest challenge the NHS has ever faced. Now we know that there are significant challenges ahead to recover and restore all of our services, but we've also seen the best from our staff and our teams in developing innovative and new ways of working. And we want to take that with us as we meet those challenges and continue to improve healthcare for our communities. I also wanted to take this opportunity to say a huge thank you to everyone who's provided us with support in those recent weeks and months. We've been inundated with their messages of goodwill, with offers of support, and even with gifts uh, and support for our teams. And it really has meant so much to us to have the support of our communities as we've met these challenges over recent weeks and months. Finally, I want to say a particular thank you to all our Foundation Trust members. Your support means a huge amount to us and we know that we'll continue to need your support in the future. Thank you. We felt that the presentation our consultant, Andrew Perry, was due to give at the Royal Berkshire was too good to miss and he has kindly recorded it for us all. Hello, my name's Andrew Perry and I'm a consultant orthopaedic surgeon here at Frimley Park. The story that I wanted to tell uh, is about my son, Charlie, who very sadly died at the age of 16 in 2017. Uh, can I introduce myself first of all? So I work here, I've been a consultant here all my uh, working consultant career since uh, 2003, so 18 years I've uh, worked here. Uh, I'm principally a knee surgeon but I also do some hips and some trauma uh, and I've been in, in charge of the department for a few years when we merged with uh, Wexham so I know Wexham and Heatherwood very well as well. Uh, my family, uh, I'm married to Rosie uh, she's a teacher at a local school and then I had uh, three children. Uh, Charlie was the eldest and he, he was uh, 16. Poppy uh, is a couple of years younger than Charlie and Ollie is a couple of years younger than Pops. Uh, so that's the family. Now I'm very conscious that some of the things that I will talk about uh, over the next five minutes or so uh, might be, uh, might raise uh, some thoughts and worries and concerns for people uh, who are listening. Um, 
I'm conscious that uh, particularly in the environment that we live at the moment with COVID around, there will be people who have lost loved ones. Now, what I really hope is that this talk is actually uh, positive. Um, I've, the, the things that I have learned uh, are, are, very, are very positive. And I would like this to be uh, a way of helping others out there who, uh, who have lost someone and helping them in their, in their grieving. So back in uh, 2017, uh, in uh, early November, uh, Charlie uh, was uh, very fit and well. And in fact, uh, there was one week, that, the weekend that he sadly died or just after, he'd been playing rugby that Saturday and I'd been to watch him play uh, a match uh, and then he went off to a, an 18th birthday party uh, where he had a great time. And I remember that, that vividly, but partly because I had to go and pick him up from it at uh, one in the morning, but also because that was his uh, first time in black tie and I taught him how to do his uh, first ever bow tie. Uh, that weekend he began to be, became unwell and by Monday he really had uh, deteriorated to the point he had to come into hospital. So he came into Frimley Park and he was wonderfully looked after here. But very sadly, he deteriorated further very rapidly and it became clear that he wasn't going to survive. Uh, so he was transferred to Southampton, where again, the specialist unit were, uh, worked, uh, worked very hard to try and save him. It actually turned out that he had a metabolic condition that we didn't know about. Uh, very rare and, uh, and sadly he, he, he succumbed to that and he died on the Tuesday uh, the 7th of November. So Charlie was your usual 16 year old. He was full of life, uh, he was full of fun, he did attack life, he used to get involved in all sorts of things. Uh, wasn't entirely straightforward all the time uh, but you'd expect that from a 16 year old I think. Uh, he was uh, very sporty, he loved his, uh, loved his cricket, uh, loved rugby, uh, but he was also very much a family boy. He, um, we had great times together, we often go down to Cornwall and uh, he would be in the water, surfing, sailing, uh, walking. Uh, he loved a game of golf with, uh, with me and with Ollie. Um, there, he did love his phone, he was 16, let's face it. Uh, but he was, he was great fun to have around and he was very, very good company. So this story really is a, uh, I've called it Charlie's story and, uh, but in fact it's really not Charlie's story, it's really our story uh, because since Charlie had, had died uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I've realised that I've learned, uh, I've learned a lot of things, uh, some very important things, both for my family life and for my working life. And uh, I thought it was right to share those. Um, so I've learned, I've reflected, and there are several things that uh, have come out of it. And what I thought I'd do here is give five things that just seem to have stuck out and struck me uh, over these last uh, couple of years. So really, this is uh, the story of us, uh, of our family and me, and the way that uh, the loss of someone has changed me. So, five things that, uh, that have struck me. And the first thing uh, is, it's, in some ways, it's blindingly obvious, um, but it, it caught me unawares, and that is that tragedy can strike anyone. Now, as a doctor, I've lived with loss and with death and with injury, uh, all my working career, but uh, in some ways you become slightly immune to it and uh, it can, therefore when it hits you personally, uh, it can be, it can hit pretty hard. And in fact, two weeks after Charlie died, I lost my uh, stepfather as well. So uh, to lose two people very quickly, it really did hit home that actually uh, that wonderful, stable family life can be struck quite quickly and quite hard. Um, so uh, I suppose that uh, I'm talking to those people who uh, feel that they're immune to difficulty. Um, these things do come along and uh, perhaps I'd, I'd say they will come along, they will come your way, uh, but when they do, there are ways through it. The second uh, thing that struck me is that Normal, traditional models of grief, uh, I don't think, work particularly well. 
Uh, there, all through medical school and uh, through our medical careers, we're taught that there is a uh, that there is a effectively a pathway of grief that you you track through, uh, which starts off with denial, then anger, depression, bargaining, and eventually, eventually you get to a position of acceptance. Um, the thing that I found is that actually it just doesn't work like that. It doesn't work that you go through a steady pathway. And in fact, what tends to happen is that you tend to bounce around all over the place. So one day you are in, uh, you, you might be angry, and the next day you are in complete acceptance, and then the other day you're very down. So that's, a, that's, that's what I found, is that pathways don't, don't work. Another example is that, uh, is the model of grief that uh, the grief is a fist and the rest of your life is a jar and initially the uh, the grief fills the jar but then over time your life fills with other experiences new memories new things happen new relationships and the jar gets bigger so actually the grief doesn't change but the, just the, the the jar increases so it, it doesn't seem to fill your life as much but in fact, the, the disappointing thing is that some days the jar just she, seems to shrink back down and it wraps around that fist again. So I think I've developed a different, uh, sort of more pragmatic picture of grief. Uh, partly that this sort of, I, I accept that there are going to be days where we bounce around a bit and, uh, or week to week. But also I've learned that it is a, a bit of a, it's a journey. And, and being a surgeon, I have the analogy of someone who's had an amputation. Um, so if you take look at someone who's had an amputation, they, they lose a limb. Initially, it's very painful, but gradually they get up on their crutches, they have a new limb fitted, and within months, if not years, they can be up on their feet, they can be climbing mountains, they can be winning gold medals at Olympics. It, it's not the same, it's never the same, you're never back to where you were before. But that kind of uh, that kind of analogy I found very helpful, and I'm somewhere on that pathway. I'm probably uh, just getting rid of my crutches and beginning to learn to walk competently. That's where I would put myself in the journey at the moment. Uh, sometimes I need my crutches again. I think I found that over the uh, months and years uh, since Charlie died, uh, I've noticed there's a difference between uh, going through grief and depression. Depression, I think. Uh, I've never suffered depression, but my understanding is that there's a real lack of feelings. You be, your mind becomes blank, you become toughened and don't really react. Whereas actually with grief, you're actually full of feelings. It's almost the opposite. And I think that since Charlie's died, I feel the highs and the lows much more than I used to. Uh, somebody described it to me as uh, uh, having one skin less. You, we, we use the phrase, uh, toughen up or uh, he's got a thick skin. Well, I think grief is exactly the opposite. You're actually one skin, one layer thinner and actually you feel things more, both the good and the bad. The third thing that I found that's really important uh, are friends. Uh, friends have been just, uh, have surrounded us uh, right from the beginning. Uh, we've always had, uh, Rosie and I have always had lots of uh, friendships and uh, we're, we're social animals. But uh, friendships have been very important to us over the uh, last two years. And here I suppose I, I speak uh, particularly to blokes, to males out there, because I think uh, in general uh, women are very good at their friendships and uh, very good at communicating, whereas as, as chat perhaps we're not. So I'm going to encourage uh, the, the men out there to develop male friendships. It's been really good. I've enjoyed um, uh, the odd uh, men's weekend away, walking, um, and I've got some very good friendships where we play sport, tennis, golf, uh, and they've been very helpful. But the reason they're good is because it encourages, uh, encourages us to talk. And uh, these friendships have been good friendships. They're friendships where people ask me genuinely how I am doing, uh, and I will do the same to them. So it's the kind of friendships that are supportive and encouraging. Those are the kind of friendships I think I would uh, uh, encourage you towards. So, number four. We found that it's been really helpful to try and make a positive, as many positives as we can from the tragedy. So the way we've done that is by 
pushing ourselves, uh, serving others, and raising money. And in some cases, we've done all three in the same uh, in the same uh, event. So, uh, an example: um, pushing ourselves. I'm not a runner. I've never been a runner. Rosie is a runner. But we decided what we would do is we would raise money by running around the Isle of Wight. Uh, so that involved for Rosie uh, running around the whole of the Isle of Wight in one day. So she ran around uh, 106 kilometres uh, and uh, made it all the way around the Isle of Wight in 20 hours. Uh, I'm not quite as fit as her and I'm also older than her. So I ran uh, halfway around the Isle of Wight. Uh, which is still 52 kilometres, it counts as an ultramarathon. Uh, and we raised uh, just over £50,000 for a combination of charities. One of the charities was in fact uh, a charity that uh, Charlie had raised money for himself. So we really wanted to continue that um, uh, work that he had done. Uh, so that was for Autistica. Um, we raised money for a uh, transplant charity. Um, Charlie, we donated his organs and uh, we really wanted to support uh, organ transplantation. And then uh, we have raised money for the Ruth Strauss Foundation as well, who support people uh, who need counselling and around the time of bereavement. One other area where uh, I've tried to make a, a positive is uh, at work. And in fact, during this, uh, slightly unexpectedly, but during this COVID time, uh, that opportunity came up. So as a result of the uh, coronavirus, um, our working patterns changed. My working patterns have changed massively. And in fact, a normal, my normal run of the mill knee surgery and hip surgery has almost come to a halt. So uh, we were reallocated and put in different working areas. And one of those areas was ITU. Now that meant that I had to go back into the ITU where Charlie was cared for. And in fact, uh, at one stage, I found myself looking after a COVID patient uh, in the ITU bed, the same bed that Charlie had been in. Now that ITU had obviously been a difficult place for me. I had been in there uh, since Charlie died, um, but it was still, it had, it had difficult memories for me. But to go in there and to be on the caring side again, and to be part of the team looking after the COVID patients actually ended up being a very positive experience for me and, and has been very helpful. The next thing I've learned is I, I really wanted to promote uh, from here on organ donation and organ transplantation. I mentioned it before. But actually we made the decision to uh, donate uh, Charlie's organs. And in fact, uh, although it was it's one of those difficult decisions and it's a difficult process to go through, we were we were very much helped by the specialist nursing team uh, at Southampton uh, who guided us through it. Um, it was the right decision, it, it, we've always felt it was the right decision. And to know on the day after Charlie died that multiple people around the country were having operations which would be life transforming for the better uh, actually ended up again being hugely positive to the beginning of our recovery and the beginning of our walk uh, as we learn to come to terms with the loss of Charlie. So we have been, uh, we have promoted organ transplantation since. Uh, uh, we have raised money for them and I have done some, uh, begun to do some talks uh, and I will continue to promote organ transplantation uh, from here on. And so from a medical perspective and from a, and from a family perspective, we're very excited that the laws have changed uh, to make it much easier uh, for organ transplantation to happen. And the, the rule changes that have happened will increase the numbers. Uh, there are so many people out there who need uh, organ transplantations and we want to promote it. And we want to promote it across uh, all sectors of society. We know that uh, certain sections of society need those organ transplantations more than others and uh, so we're, we're going to actively promote it and encourage it and hopefully support it by raising some money. So thank you again very much for listening. Uh, for those people who it did raise uh, uh, questions uh, then please do go and talk to someone, find a, a good friend to go and uh, talk things through. Uh, it was lovely to be able to do it. Uh, it was, uh, we would love to have done this face to face 
uh, but it's great to be able to do it uh, online. Uh, so thank you very much for listening and hopefully one day we will be face to face again.